Thank you so much um, for all of you coming out this evening. We're just going to start um, with a few announcements. Hello, everyone. I am your member relations chair, Danny Casey, and I just have a couple of things. First of all, um, the conference committee for conference 2014 has been hard at work planning the conference, which will be happening in 2014 in Toronto. So there. <laughs> So you might have seen the new uh, Save the Date cards by the door. If you haven't picked one up yet, please do, because they're gorgeous, and they just came out this week. So they're really pretty and exciting. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> hang on, hold your horses. Um, so the conference title is Tracking Change, E-Merging Markets, Methods and Markets, or en français, Suivre les Modifications, Méthodes et Marchés Émergents. It will be June 6th to 8th, 2014, at the Lee Kosh Knowledge Institute, which is, um, as I understand it, near St. Michael's Hospital. Um, and I'm just going to read off the paper right now because I have no idea what it says. Uh, we will have a constant need for writers, copy editors, and proofreaders, but right now, uh, what the conference committee is particularly keen to, they're talk, keen to talk to any member who's interested in being a sponsorship coordinator. So if you're interested in coordinating sponsorships, working with the conference co-chairs, who are Nancy Ferran and Emily Dockwell jones um, to help promote the benefits of sponsoring the EAC conference in order to secure new and returning corporate sponsors for the conference. So, they will be responsible for reviewing the current sponsorship package and suggesting improvements, coordinating the brainstorming of possible sponsors, and contacting possible sponsors and tracking their responses. So if you have any interest, Nancy is sitting here in the front row. Many of you already know who that person is. Um, or if you have any interest, just uh, let me know and I can give you their email addresses if you want to talk over email. Okay. Le groupe francophone de la section Toronto va se rencontrer pour la première fois cette année le lundi 14 octobre à 18h. On va se rencontrer au Resto Pub le Duke of York. <laughs> <laughs> au 39 Avenue Prince Arthur. <laughs> si vous voulez de plus amples informations, veuillez contacter la co coordinatrice des affaires francophones pour la section Nancy again, uh, à Toronto, Sunny. Francophone, francophone, <laughs> au réviseur.ca. So, if you have any questions, let me know. I also have one announcement from the mentorship committee. So, the mentorship committee has shifted from matching mentors and mentees seasonally in the spring and fall to matching on a more ongoing basis. So, as applications come in, they're going to be doing it on a more ad hoc basis based on mentors' av availability which is intended to facilitate mentorship that is convenient to both mentors and mentees. So more news will be coming in the next few weeks and months, but if you'd like to contact the mentorship committee in the meantime, you can reach them at toronto underscore mentorship at editors.ca. You can also find more info at this link, which I will not read out loud because it's <laughs> Let me know. The mentorship committee members are Joe Coturcio Million, Mil I can't say words, Milligan, Janet McMillan, and Nancy. <laughs> so basically, for all of these announcements, talk to Nancy. <laughs> um, finally, I'd like to call up Nadia Osmani, who is our seminarist chair, to make another announcement. And there will be no rapping. <laughs> um, so I'm just here to remind everyone about the seminar season that's starting shortly. Um, don't forget to sign up for search engine optimization, which is on October 5th. It's excellent for the resume because more and more businesses need editors who can make their content reach the top spot on Google and Bing and Yahoo and so on. In addition, um, technical writing, the focus of Tech Writing Soup for the Editor's Soul, which is on October 19th, is great for people seeking um, stable work. While the availability of in-house editing jobs is on a downward trend, um, tech writing and editing jobs remain really steady. So those are two good examples of seminars that can open up career possibilities for everyone, which I know everyone's eager for those. <laughs> so pick up a postcard on your way out. Thanks. Thank you. All right, thanks, Danny and Nadia. I'd like to welcome everyone tonight to um, EAC Toronto's first branch uh, program of the season. 
My name is Andrea Sibicino and I'm this year's program chair. Before I introduce this evening's guest speaker, I'd like to go over some housekeeping matters. Uh, the restrooms are just located directly down the hall. Uh, this evening's program will be recorded and posted on the EAC Toronto branch website along with the program report. If there are any tweeters in the house this evening, um, you can uh, tweet the Twitter handles at EAC Toronto, um, our guest speaker at Ted Barris, and you can also use the hashtag EAC Toronto. And coffee and tea will be available after the presentation, so we hope you can stay. I'm very honored to welcome Ted Barris to this evening's program. Ted is an award-winning journalist, author, and broadcaster. His writing has appeared in the Globe and Mail, the National Post, and in magazines such as Legion and Air Force. He's worked as host contributor for CBC Radio and TV Ontario, and has been a full-time professor of journalism and broadcasting at Centennial College since 2002. As one of Ted's former students, I can honestly say he's a phenomenal teacher. Ted has authored 17 best-selling non-fiction books, including a series on wartime Canada. Some titles include June, Canadians at D-Day, June 6, 1944, Days of Victory, Behind the Glory, Deadlock in Korea, Breaking the Silence, Veterans Untold Stories from the Great War to Afghanistan, and more recently, The Great Escape, a Canadian Story. What I found interesting while visiting his website, tedbarris.com, is that writing military history was not his first choice. Ted began his writing career in search of stories and built a solid reputation for getting the facts straight and telling the history well. He joins us this evening to talk about his new book, The Great Escape, A Canadian Story, a book that is based on original interviews, assembly of memories, letters, diaries, and personal photos. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ted Barris. Students, they always do you proud. <laughs> Thanks, Andrea. By the way, today I went back into my records to, because I wanted to be up on top of uh, her uh, uh, work with me ten, 10 years ago um, at Centennial. And uh, Andrea um, was a B to B plus student most of the time. <laughs> but she taught the class in an assignment that was most dear to me, and that was the Remembrance Day story. She got an A plus, best in the class. Which is somehow very appropriate tonight. So thank you for, and, and she's the one who tracked me down and invited me here tonight, and I'm honored to be here. And it's like, there are all kinds of different sections of my, Laura's here is also a, a former student of mine. Um, uh, Martha Jackson, whom I met on, on Sunday at the words, Word on the Street. Caroline came up to me. Caroline Kaiser is the younger sister, very much younger sister, <laughs> of a pal of mine from high school days, Colin Kaiser. And so is there anybody else from, the, <laughs> from my past here tonight? Or, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Don't watch this, Jane. It's... Um, thank you so much. And, and I, I have to say, I, I admit to you right up front, you're guinea pigs tonight. These books are literally the very first ones out of the box. These aren't even in the stores yet because um, it's a long process. But as editors, you'll appreciate it. And, and maybe I'll come back to that if, if you so desire. Uh, to talk a little bit about that part of the business and the profession, which has kind of gone crazy in the last few years, and it's getting crazier even as we speak. This book um, uh, was about to go to press as a Thomas Allen book, just as Thomas Allen was purchased by Dunder. And you can imagine waking up one morning and seeing that the company that I'd had six or seven bu books published with uh, was suddenly getting gobbled up by another, and I didn't know anybody on that team whatsoever and thinking, uh-oh, there's a whole lot of corporate stuff going on up there, and I'm down here in the weeds <coughs> trying to get this book printed, and lit it was literally uh, on the verge of their pressing the button for the printing and installed. Um, and that's when I uh, kind of 
gathered all of my skills as an editor, as a writer, as a politician, small p, and I started working on the process of making sure this book did not miss the fall launch. And fortunately, uh, it's happened, and I, and I went up to the warehouse. They arrived the day before yesterday. I went up, grabbed some copies, bought them, <laughs> so that I could have some tonight, and that several of my bookstore friends at Independence um, uh, could have them as well. Anyway, so you're kind of my guinea pigs tonight, because I've done talks like this for 20, 25 years, but I've never done one on this this book until tonight. So if I stumble a little bit and I'm not exactly where to go, sure where to go, bear with me, we'll get there together. This story is a story that has stuck with me for almost 50 years. Okay, you do the math, I'm 64. Um, and it began, of course, with the movie, which was released 50 years ago this past summer, 1963. And of course, remember the posters, and the images of The Great Escape, the movie, from that era in 1963. And even more, I'm sure many of you can probably whistle or hum <laughs> this. I don't know if you can hear it. Yes, yes. And look at the names. Donald Pleasance, Charles Bronson, James Coburn, David McCallum. This was a cast of all the hunks of the, of the era. It's just about over. I'm not going to play too much of this. The film cost $4 million. It grossed eleven million dollars. It was in its in its era the most watched, the most sought after wartime saga on film ever. In fact, today it is still number four on the all-time list of wartime movies that people rent, download, get for Christmas time holidays. You know, uh, man caves and basements all over the world. <laughs> And, and, and women caves, too, because it's a great, great story. Charles Bronson, depicted in the movie as the claustrophobic tunnel king, right? American actor of European descent. But the real tunnel king was Wally Floody, born in Chatham, Ontario, spent his teenage years and pre-university years in Sudbury and Timmins as a hard rock miner. Remember that. Yeah. <laughs> but he became the Tunnel King at Stalag Love 3. James Garner, talk about heartthrobs, <laughs> certainly in 1963, depicted in the film as an American in the RAF, the scrounger. Remember the opening scenes when he lifts the chunks of steel for the what would become the sledgehammer and he goes around fleecing the guards, all that sort of stuff. Great old Yankee know-how getting in there to get the stuff done. Well, the scrounger, sorry to tell you, was Barry Davidson, a pilot from Calgary. He was the guy who did all the fleecing of the guards, all of the necessary uh, gathering and scrounging for things that they needed and everything from tools to paper for the documents that they forged, to, to uh, <laughs> utensils, um, and all of the wonderful things that they managed to pull together to bribe the guards to get the things they needed. Donald Plessence. He was in the film, the chief forger. Remember in the film, he, rem he, he memorizes his steps in the room so that he can convince the guys and the rest of the team that he can still join the escape. Why? He's going blind. Because of all the detail work he's been doing, right? Brit. <laughs> Sorry. Real forger was Tony Pengelly. Born in Truro. Grew up in Weston. Shot down in 1940. He had a knack for photography, and he's one of the guys involved in the fleecing of the guards and the ability to bring in the scrounging of everything from paper to documents. I'll read a section from the book about how they did it a little later on if you like. But he was 
another Canadian, as the chief forger. <coughs> Gordon Jackson, British actor, plays the intelligence chief. He's the guy who's involved in incoming and outgoing information circulating around the Great Escape. One of the greatest problems was keeping everything secret. And the intelligence gathering and dispensation, you were only allowed to know what was necessary, nothing more. And Jackson plays, as a Scot, plays the intelligence chief. Sorry, Kingsley Brown. Born also in Nova Scotia, well-known journalist, wrote for the Toronto Star, the Halifax Chronicle, learned to fly in Halifax in his spare time, shot down as a bomber pilot, and became the chief of intelligence, making sure that everything was kept secret and all the documentation gathered would be used for the appropriate document forgeries. He spent months in the library doing nothing but gathering details on the identities of German officers and German officials whose names and identities could be stolen, replicated in the documents, so that when the great escapers got out, they'd have contemporary, absolutely up to the minute, up to date data on their documents, convincing the officials wherever they went that everything was official, above board, and perfectly normal. A man of great detail. I'll tell you a story a little later on about him. The other interesting myth about The Great Escape, how many of you actually saw the movie at one time or another? Just about everybody, right? Laura, you'll have to download it. <laughs> Go to your woman cave. The myth is that suddenly this idea of The Great Escape was born at Stalag Luft III, where all these guys were dumped in April of 1942, that it really began there. Not so, not at all. When I tracked down the documentation, the diaries, the letters, all of the background on all these men, Canadians, whose worlds I went into and researched for the, the book, I realized that most of them had been shot down early in the war. They were what the Germans referred to as the bad apples in the system. They were all escapeniks. They just wouldn't stop trying to escape. And here is the nucleus of the Great Escape team at a place called Bart, or B-A-R-T-H. Is that, help me with German, Bart, correct? In northern Germany. This is where Stalag Luft I was. Here is Tony Pangeli. It's a little bit uh, contrasty. The forger. This is Barry Davidson, the scrounger. This is 1940, two years before they ever got to Stalag Luft III. Here's a guy named uh, Bartlett. Um, that's horrible, I forgot his first name. He'll come to me. He was born in Capel, Saskatchewan, also a bomber, uh, uh, a um, dive bomb pilot, shot down in, over Norway in 1940. His job, because he had a wonderful capability of hiding things, was to hide a tool, an item in the camps that even the movie didn't tell you was there. Most history books don't tell you that the guys inside the Great Escape Camp Stella Level of Three had a shortwave radio. They got nightly broadcasts from the BBC and encrypted messages sent by Morse code at the end of those. Once the, once the authorities in Britain knew that they were there, they began filtering information through them. And Bartlett was in charge of what was known as the canary, the radio. And when he got, he actually got the radio parts when they were in Bart. And he concealed them for two years wherever they were going because the Germans moved them around and then ultimately moved them to Stalag Luft III, not as in the movie in, in Germany on the border with Switzerland so that um, our friend Steve McQueen could fly over the fences with his motorcycle. No, 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 no. <laughs> Stalag Luft III was 110 kilometers southeast of Berlin in Poland, in a place called Zagan. I'll show you some images in a minute. But Bartlett smuggled the radio from Bart to Stalag Luft III at Zagan, hidden inside a medicine ball. You know what a medicine ball is? There, it's like a, you know what it is? It's like a, it's like a calisthenics exercise ball. It's heavier. What would it be, about the size of a basketball? Maybe a little bigger. A little bigger. And the des it was designed for hand-eye coordination and, and, you know, it was fairly heavy, so it wasn't abnormal that the weight of the radio could be inside. 
all the way from Germany, from Bark, Germany, to Zagon, Poland. He hid it in the medicine ball. The German, Germans never thought to look inside. And that's how they, and even when they were in the camp, bits and pieces of radio gear were smuggled across the various compounds from the American compound into the uh, Commonwealth one and all over the place, in the medicine ball and, and, and everywhere else. They were masters of deceit. Okay. Another picture from Bart. Here's one of the barracks rooms. Again, Tony Pengelly, the forge chief. Sorry? Um, yes. Yeah, pinups, you know, but hey. Um, and this is Wally Floody. Now, Wally Floody was not, yes, he was, a, he was a hard rock miner. I told you that earlier. And again, when he arrived at Stalag Lift 3, they were all thrown into the camp. When he got there, when, when the Canadians got there, there were somewhere in the neighborhood of 5,000 prisoners in Stalag Lift 3 into the original compound. Before Wally Floody got to Stalag Lift 3 in 1942, he had dug 48 tunnels. This guy was experienced. And one of the interesting quotes from Pengeli, well, I won't approximate it, I'll read it for you. Because it's kind of, it really does sum up. The problem they faced in the early attempts was that they were all independent solo attempts at escaping. And in the first chapter, I finished the chapter by when, when Tony gets to uh, Bart and he's been part of a number of escape attempts. He says, the German captors found every one of our tunnels and every one of our, stopped every one of our escapes. Quote, that was because at Bart, escaping was strictly private enterprise. And Gelly said. <laughs> but a man can't forge his own identity papers, dig his own tunnel, make his own wire clippers, escape clothes, maps, and compasses. From our futility, we knew we would have to organize to be successful. So it was a team effort, and it was the, it was the experience built up among the team members that de delivered the success or tragedy of the Great Escape, because we'll get there too. But it was the team effort that made this extraordinary thing happen. Are okay. there spoilers in this talk? Sorry? <laughs> I said, are there spoilers in this talk? Oh yeah, I'm ruining it for you. You've never seen the movie. Um, let's move on. Here's Stalag Luft 3 from about, oh, a couple of thousand feet, maybe 10,000 feet. It's a it's, it's, um, um, photograph taken in 1943 or 44. Uh, it's upside down, but I want to just, so you can see this is a security document here. It's actually uh, north to south. If you ever go to Zagon, or if you remember the movie, remember the train station? which is the, one of the climactic moments of the film when all these guys are moving towards the train station to take any one of six different train lines uh, that are all converging here. This is passage, that's actually going northwest to Berlin, southeast to uh, Breslau, I believe. Now, these are all the compounds that evolved into what was the final camp ultimately. This dark area you see here, it's not very clear, but it's, this is all pine forest. There was a psychological aspect to this imprisonment. These guys, they, they grew to be in number, 10,000 prisoners in this, in this camp. And they were all broken up into different compound areas. They all, when they arrived, they all lived in this camp. This was the first compound here. It's known as the East Compound. This is the Vorlager, which was the area where the Germans had all their administration and, their, and the, the troops that were the guards. Bear in mind that they were not uh, supervised by guards as in prison guards. They were supervised by Luftwaffe, officers and men. This was an Air Force prison. And so, one of the ironies of this whole enterprise was that the German Air Force controlled the prison of allied airmen. It actually turned out to be both a blessing and a curse. So this is governed by the German Air Force. And the compounds, as the, as the camp grew, in 1942, in April 42, they were here. In April of 43, this camp, the North Camp, was being opened up. 
and that's where many of the Commonwealth aircrew were being taken. By the time they reached there, there were 2,000 of them. And this is the camp from which the Great Escape occurred. Um, by the way, contrary to the movie, there were no Americans in that camp. Not, well, there was one. I'll tell you about him later. Remind me. Because just as this camp was being completed and the, and the Commonwealth airmen were conjuring up this plan of the three tunnels and getting them underway, the Germans opened up this camp, the South Camp, and that's where all the Americans went. There wasn't an American in the Commonwealth camp unless he was a member of the RAF, which, and that was the case in, in some instances. And then over here, farther to the west, remember this is upside down, um, was, uh, this is where many of the German labor force, uh, the, the Russian prisoners who were used as forced labor lived, and they were the, the men who essentially built the camp. <coughs> Again, I, haven't, I, I should point out if, if it's not already obvious, the officers in this camp, the men were all officers, and by the Geneva Conventions, the Germans could not and did not force officers to work. So, from morning to night and, and all night long, with the exceptions of two times in the daytime, something called appel, which is roll call, <coughs> they were left to their own devices. To entertain themselves, to exercise themselves, to feed themselves, to do everything, clean their clothes, arrange their food, all of that, which, you know, like the, the availability went up and down through the war. But they were essentially idle in terms of what the Germans left them to be. And as I said, the Germans viewed this as the basket into which all the bad apples went. All the guys who'd attempted to, to escape again and again and again. Well, hell, if, if, if Floody had tried to escape through 48 tunnels, I mean, he was just unstoppable. And he, like the rest of them, were thrown in this camp. OK, here's what it looked like on the ground. Pretty desolate. These fences were about 10 or 12 feet high, double. Two lines of fences, coil wire between each. There were, you can see all the stumps of the, of the trees cut for this area. There's a warning wire, I think it's better on this image here. Yeah, see that, the small posts here? That's a warning wire. They were told if they crossed that wire, chasing a ball, trying to escape, anything, they'd be shot. And, the, and there were men who were. So they were to stay within the bounds of that warning wire and to stay, not, never to step over. And what was interesting is, and, and I, I haven't got the time to read it tonight, there's a whole section of the book about how the minute they got into this camp, this is actually the, this is the uh, Commonwealth camp looking from the American side into the Commonwealth side, and that's the Vorlager over there, that fence line. Am I, am I making any sense? Okay. Um, the minute they got in there, as, and this is accurate, in the, portrayed in, in the movie. The minute they got in there, they all start trying to escape. And it's just nuts. There's all kinds of crazy plans. One guy even tried to escape, um, made up as a dog. <laughs> and of course, they jumped into trucks, and they you know, went into latrines, and all kinds of trying to, anyway, we'll get to more of that. Yes? Wasn't it the officer's duty? Part of your job was to escape? Good point. I went, I searched, speaking of editing and research, I searched high and low, and it took me a long time to find out whether it, indeed it was an officer's duty to escape. And it's not overt in the, in, the, in the research, but if you go to what's called the King's Regulations, which is the guide for, um, um, what would you call it, allegiance and conduct um, and loyalty in the Air Force, it's fairly plain that it would be a nice idea if you tried to escape, but that's about as far as it went. It was not in black and white, you must uh, try to escape or you must escape. And, and, but it depended on the officers, and many of the officers, um, including a guy named Wings Day, who was one of the um, SBOs, the senior British officers. Remember that, yes, this was a camp that was governed essentially by the senior officers being British, but all the work was done by the Canadians. Anyway, uh, this is another image inside the camp. That's a grain elevator way over at the train station. And these are the barracks. They each housed about 50 to 75 men. They were actually not too bad. If you go there today, you'll see a replica. They had a decent space in them. 
They each, many of the rooms had stoves and, and much of the, the supplies provided for heat in the winter, although many not. Um, it was much worse in the, obviously, in the concentration camps and the forced labor camps where nothing was maintained. It was, it was something um, that came out of this tradition of loyalty to the Air Force so that the Luftwaffe recognized that honor among airmen. Um, all of the camps had these uh, towers. They called them goon towers. And it wasn't, a, it wasn't pejorative in the sense that it was um, um, a, a name that they invented because these guys were goony. It's actually short for German officer of something, I can't remember now. But it, it actually was a short form, so they just called them goons. But this was, this was the, the nature of it. It, it. They had spotlights, they had uh, Hundführer, which is the, uh, the dogs, um, and, and German officers handling the dogs at night and, and through uh, many of the, uh, the daytimes as well. Here's, another, here's a diagram of the North Compound showing you the tunnels. The first one dug was Dick, the next one was Tom, and Harry. The Germans never found Dick. Never. George was built after the Great Escape. It was an attempt to um, hide the weapons that they had, were gathering for because by the, the end of the war, getting on towards late 1944, early 45, the Russians were coming from the east. And eventually, and I'll get to this in a, in a bit too, the Germans gathered up 10,000 prisoners and forced marched them all the way across Europe. All these guys were forced marched, the ones who were left. 10,000 of them in the coldest winter of the war. In, from January to May of 1945. Interesting picture, also from Bart. These are the masterminds. I don't know about Sangster, because I don't think I have too much documentation on him. He was from Winnipeg. Wally Floody, John Weir, Hank Berkeley. Designed the tunnels, dug the tunnels. Canadians. Johnny Weir, he looks very strange there. Look closely at his face. It's the, the image on, over his eyes, um, quite compelling. When his aircraft, his Spitfire, was shot down, he lost his eyelids. Can you imagine tunneling for the better part of a year or two with no eyelids? Birkeland came from, and Johnny Weir came from Toronto. I'll get back to him in a minute. Berkeley came from Spear Hill, Manitoba, <coughs> also a miner. The Germans didn't know this. All they had on their occupation forms, or the, their sort of identification forms, was that they were Air Force officers and their profession, whether they were, or their trade, pilot, navigator, wireless radio operator, air gunner, flight engineer, bomb aimer, whatever, um, rigger, fitter, whatever. That's the only thing that they put in, the, in their occupations. They didn't know that these guys were miners or that Floody had designed tunnels in Sudbury and in uh, iron ore mines. And so the tunneling begins in, like, literally their first meeting. And the, 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 thing that was, the thing that I do give credit to the Brits, well, actually not the Brits, but a South African, uh, for is that Roger Bushell was the mastermind of the whole thing. And he came on the scene just before they moved to the North Compound, just before they went to the Commonwealth uh, area, Roger Bushell arrives, he's South African in the RAF, and he is hell-bent to destroy the Reich, one prisoner at a time. And it's his idea to take what had been kind of piecemeal digging and escape act activity and bring it together into the three tunnels. And it's interesting because Wally Floody reacts when they have the first meeting of the X organization. It's called X. This is the organization planning the escape. And at the first meeting, Bushel says, we're going to have three tunnels. They're going to be going simultaneously. Tom, Dick, and Harry, here's where they're going to be. Floody, tell us how they're going to work. And Floody turns to Bushel and he says, now we're talking. Hmm. In other words, now we've got the idea that this is a planned, organized, comprehensive escape plan from the get-go. And the digging begins, in fact, <laughs> when the Germans were building the North Compound, Bushel arrived and several of the others volunteered as goodwill to go into the camp that was being constructed and to help the Germans. 
<laughs> and the Germans thought, well, isn't this nice? The guys feel really welcome here. Come on in. I mean, the, the wire was already up. But every step that the, that the Commonwealth guys, particularly the Canadians, did inside the North Compound, they were measuring. They were seeking blind spots in the fences. They were trying to figure out how far it was from one barracks to another, where the soft sand was, all of the details. They even stole documents that had the diagrams for the sewers in the camp in hopes that they could use the sewers to escape. And very soon after they got into the camp, a guy named um, uh, Shag Reese, tiny, tiny Welshman, they shoved him down the sewer to see if he could find out if it was an escape route. It was too narrow. It went down to narrower than two feet. So it was impossible. But they knew exactly where the sewers were. They had everything. They knew more about the camp the Germans were building than the Germans did. And then they moved in, <laughs> appropriately, on April the 1st, 1943. <laughs> Another of the people there was a man named Lee Kenyon. He was a British officer and an artist. And they got him to capture the moments of the escape in sketches. This is Hut 104. Let me go back here. This is where Harry is. And that's the trap door into Harry. And the trap door was under a stove. You can see the stove is here. There was tiling on the floor. They got three Polish airmen who knew tile works better than anybody, and they replicated the tile and the floor, then smashed the ones that were there to get down into the one uh, connecting body between the barracks hut and the ground. I, something I forgot <coughs> to tell you. All the barracks were on stilts above the ground, so that the Germans, the, the, they called them the ferrets, the, the Allies called them ferrets because they were always looking for the tunnels, so that the ferrets could see under all the bar barracks buildings the only thing that connected the huts to the ground were the blocks on which the barracks hut stood and the stove foundations. Mm -hmm. And it was through the stove foundations that they dug, they chipped away the entrances to the tunnels. So, stove is here, used by these little um, support beams, lifted off, trap door is opened, tunneler goes down, Trap doors closed, doors put in place. They've even got the, uh, the, uh, the what do you call it? Chimney, so that they can keep, if, it's, if the chimney was smoking when they took it off the pedestal, they had a longer extension chimney to keep connected to the exhaust so that the Germans didn't see an interruption in the smoke leaving the chimney. It was that sophisticated. And this is Lee Kenyon's sketch. And just to give you a sense of the sophistication, look at how many guys are here. One, two, three, four, five, six. There are six guys in the one room. There were stooges everywhere. That's what the guys who were involved in the security were called, stooges. And the Canadians made up the bulk of them as well. Here's what it looked like from the bottom of Harry, looking up to the trap door I just showed you. What impresses me most of all about that is how deep it was. They went down nine meters straight down through the cement concrete base of the stove, in through the ground, down nine meters into the ground, before they went 360 meters out towards the fence and then nine meters back up. So it's 30 feet, 330 feet, 30, but 400 feet of tunnel they built. Why did they do that? Because one of the secret weapons the Germans had in the camps, which the guys who had plenty of experience knew about, were microphones in the ground. The Germans expected there'd be tunneling, and so the microphones would amplify any clanging, banging, scratching, whatever, going underground. Well, the, the tunnel designers, Floody, designed the, all the tunnels to go down 30 feet before they went an inch laterally, so that none of what was going on underground could be heard. At the base of the tunnel, the, that, that's, we're looking from the bottom of the shaft up the ladder, this is the this is the light in the room at the top. This, that, that trap door falls down on top of that, so we're looking up the shaft. There's the ladder. <clears throat> at the bottom was a little uh, series of three workshops. So the tunnel or the shaft went straight down, and it went in four directions from the, from the, the shaft. One area, one little alcove had a workshop. One little alcove had a 
bellows, big piece of canvas on a series of um, uh, tracks that pushed fresh air into the tunnel. And then there was a third um, alcove which had the little trolleys that they hauled out the dirt on. You can see that here, these trolleys. And then the fourth one was for the installation of any other equipment, storing of equipment in men. Now, interesting, little warning system here. See that, that little can? It's got pebbles in it. If anything were happening nine meters up that threatened the tunnel, somebody was approaching a guard, a ferret or something, someone would rattle a little string or pull on the string, we'd rattle the tin cup and everything went silent in the shop down in the base of the shaft. Everybody stopped at what they were doing. It was so sophisticated, the, 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 the uh, um, security. So there's, these are sketches from Lee Kenyon's um, collection. And it took me years to find out where these were. <laughs> Obvious is the nose on my face, and I got a lot of nose on my face. Um, the RAF Museum in Hendon, just outside uh, London, has the rights to these. I found out after about a year's research. And I secured the rights to use them in the book. And this is my favorite sketch of all. It shows a tunnel at the face of the tunnel, digging at the sand and pulling the earth in towards him. And you look at the hair here. Does that remind you of somebody? Let me go back. <laughs> Johnny Weir, the guy without the eyelids. Johnny Weir, <laughs> Johnny Weir was in the tunnel day after day after day, and he and Berkland traded off shifts. And Floody had them working um, when on opposite shifts. Berkland was working in the tunnel. They usually went down in threes. One man digging, another man passing the earth into the trolley, and the third man moving the trolley back to the exit. When Berkland was digging, he was digging, he was left-handed, so he dug to the left. Weir was in the tunnel, he was right-handed. He dug to the right, so they made sure that they went in after each other to compensate. So eventually the tunnel would get to where it was going. <laughs> Again, this wonderful sketch. There are cave-ins, countless cave-ins, because sand, un unlike the, the earth at Bart, with which was very clay-like, and the water table was very high, lots of flooding, this was sandy. It had a benefit and a, and it was it was a benefit and a, and a curse. What they did was, these are you can't see quite as well as clearly as in the book, but these are slats. Each of these came. It's, it's like the frame of the tunnel. They were the bedboards. They used thousands and thousands of bedboards in the tunnel, digging away. And the way it worked was, they would dig with the wood in place. They would place the wood. Um, in the walls, it was slightly narrower at the top than at the bottom. You can't see that here, but it was almost going towards A-frame. But the way they beveled the edges of the wood, the wood, like on a cabinet, didn't need nails. The wood came together at the joints like this, so that it would simply rest, so that the guy would dig with the wood over top of him and let the sand cave in around him, over the wood, sometimes into the area he was working, it would be cleared, wood put in, sand brought down just to pack it tight. It would be like tamping it. And it was fine if the, wood, if the boards were not rotten, but sometimes they were, and the cave-ins precipitated great cave-ins, and there was a one episode in there in which uh, Johnny Weir saves uh, Wally Floody because very early in the, in the construction of one of the, of one of the I think it was Tom, very early, there are three of them right down to the base of the shaft, and one of the bedboards in the wall of the shaft cracked and broke, and the sand came pouring out of the wall straight down. The first two guys got up, but Floody got buried in sand here, and it kept on, and they grabbed him and pulled him out. This was serious business. Here's what Harry looked like in cross-section. This is the successful tunnel. It's in room 23, hut 104, Nine meters down, here's the little, here are the chambers, the workshop, the sandbags, the, the, uh, the bellows. They built tracks for the trolleys. Oh, and how did they get air into the system? The bellows needed um, tubing 
to deliver air the, you know, as, the, as the tunnel grew, they had to get the air farther and deeper into the horizontal tunnel, and they got what were called Klim cans. Klim is milk spelled backwards. And the powdered milk they got came in cans about the size of, I guess today if you went and bought the big tomato cans, it would be about maybe four or five inches in diameter. And one guy's job, uh, Albert Wallace, he's still with us here in Toronto, he's coming to a launch event that I'm having on Thursday up in Uxbridge. Al Wallace's job, every day of his existence at the camp, was to run after appell, after roll call, to the dump where the Germans dumped their odds and ends and the, Al and the Commonwealth Flyers. What did he look for? He looked for solder. Retrieved the solder so it could be remelted to link together the Klim cans, and they gave literally air, delivered air, under the floorboards and under the tracks, the full 300 feet of the tunnel. Imagine the number of cans in that. Here's Johnny Weir. Great story, fabulous story, um, and one that I was fortunate to get access to through his widow. I met her a while ago and was fortunate um, in meeting her to be invited into her home and to sit and talk to her about John and she all she wanted was to get John's story out and so uh, we sat in her dining room overlooking uh, Casa Loma or in that area or the city downtown with her dog's head in my lap we're sitting at the table and having a lovely chat over tea and she told me about how they fell in love uh, they went down to, they were, it was like a um, um, uh, blind date. They ended up at the uh, uh, Palais Royale and danced on the great big floor up, uh, in 1940, fell in love, 39 I guess, uh, and decided to get married. She became, um, she worked with the, one of the companies in town as a chauffeur for the company that built ASDIC, which is the sound uh, detecting device that the Navy used in, for their um, naval vessels to detect submarines. Anyway, she worked with that company. He joined the Air Force, went overseas. The reason I'm focusing on him is just to give you a sample of the wonderful dimension of the letters and what they meant to these, to both the, the home front folks and the airmen themselves. Here's a sample of the letter. He's in Stalag Love 3. Flight Officer John Weir. These little sheets of paper, they were entitled to maybe uh, 15 or 20 of these a month. The paper was about maybe that wide, a little narrower, and about that long. And they would write, and it was quite thin, paper, like onion skin paper. And you've seen some of these before where the, um, the, the paper folds in on itself to create an envelope. Well, this is the exterior with the address to Robin W. McCormack, Francis was her name at, at Heathdale. Where Heathdale is, as I say, it's up overlooking the downtown. I've just drawn this excerpt to give you a sense of the writing between the lines that was in these letters. They were all censored. You can see, uh, examined by censor, DB17, whatever. All these letters were censored because if there was any suggestion of information going out or coming in that wasn't to be there, it would either be blacked out or cut out. Well, John was so good with the language, and he wrote, I think he wrote something like 120 letters over the course of his imprisonment, and she many more than that to him. Here's an interesting sample of how he was signaling to Francis about what they were doing and what they needed. <clears throat> the pajamas you sent him, the J July package, parcel, just came in time. My others were sort of on their bum ends. Hope you don't mind. Bright pajamas, dear. And then he gets talking about a little bit about, I mean, their, their relationship. What were the pajamas about? The pajamas they kept asking for from the home front were the outfits they used in the tunnels. Most, many of the diggers did, dug naked. But Wally Floody didn't like that because 
the diggers would get scrapes on their arms and their knees and elsewhere, and, they, and the Germans would spot them. So they got really light fabric, pajamas, to be the gear that was used for the diggers. And so she kept sending him pajamas. And she probably couldn't figure out for the longest damn time what the hell he needs so many pajamas for. <laughs> Clearly, it was to be distributed among the diggers and because they were going through them pretty quickly. But here's the neat thing. That's just the beginning. What we need most are gramophone needles. Or as they're uh, or as they're practically non-existent at home, no, sorry, or are they practically non-existent at home too? Gramophone needles. Okay, there was a library, there was a recording record collection, there was a gramophone. But how many gramophone needles are you going to go through <laughs> in a prison camp? Well, you might go through a lot, especially if you use the needles because they could be magnetized and become the directing signal or arm of a compass. And so the gramophone needles, which the Germans had no idea why these guys <laughs> wanted them, get shipped in constantly so that they could be used in the compasses. And a guy named Al Hack was the compass maker. I think he was New Zealand, a New Zealander or an Australian. And his, he was so proud <laughs> and insistent on the way these things were manufactured I could go on about them, it's quite complicated, but they, they made beautiful compasses. And each one of the compasses was imprinted on the bottom, Stalag Love 3, just so that they could make sure that there was, there was no, uh, no um, um, what would you call it, where it's replicated uh, illegally. Um, what's it? Yeah, yeah. No knockoffs here. <laughs> anyway, that's what the gramophone needles are for. And it took me the longest damn time to figure, you know, what's the... And, and I'm sure finally Francis figured it out. But this is just one indication. You know what the other thing? I, I, I had a chance to interview a guy named... Uh, or um, the, the Sorensen family in Kingston. Vicki Sorensen, dear friend because of this whole project. And Vicki sent me all of her dad's letters to her, her mom. Because the, the Frank and... and uh, and Betty were married in Kingston before uh, he left. And Frank kept asking for the family to keep sending, allegedly for the library at the camp, thesauruses. <laughs> <laughs> I called Vicky and I said, Vicky, what is this with the thesauruses? She said, I don't know, I never even noticed it before. I said, there's about four or five letters here where all Frank is asking for the family to send in the Red Cross boxes are the sources. <laughs> and I thought, wait a minute. And I grabbed about five or six of the, I've got a library of them, uh, as the ladies in the audience know, um, <laughs> that I, have, I pride myself in, in reference books. So I had about four or five of the thesauruses, and I went, and you know what each one of them has? And you check this tonight when you go back home. Almost every thesaurus you'll find has a section somewhere in it that offers conversational translations for French, <coughs> German, Dutch, yeah. Polish, Italian, somewhere in them. They were used to help develop, build the conversational capability of the escapers so that when they got out, they could speak the words of greeting, of direction, of need, all based on, the, that's why the thesauruses were going. And the Germans thought they were just filling the library with all the <laughs> reference tools that the prisoners would need to enjoy their lives in the prison. <laughs> okay, here's Kingsley Brown, the journalist. His job was to do, to gather the documentation. There's a wonderful story in the book. When I did, when I got a hold of his papers, he described, can I take my jacket off? <laughs> he describes, um, he describes arriving in the camp, and of course, when you arrive in, in the camp, you're under some suspicion, because there was lots of uh, there were lots of plants being put in among the airmen. There were airmen coming in constantly every day, so the the Commonwealth flyers were quite wary of the potential of German plants in among the airmen who would spy. And there were some guys who were who were caught doing that, and they were very badly treated. They weren't killed, but within an inch of their lives. 
And every new guy came in, unless you had somebody to vouch for you, you were under suspicion until you could prove you were who you said you were. When, when Brown gets there, he's finally given the green light and he's put in one of the rooms where tunnel is being built. And he watches the tunnel. He, he, his first night there, he's on a bunk and it stank. The room just stank. Because, you know, got guys who can't have baths every day necessarily. And the smoke from the kerosene lamps and the food they'd cooked. He's sitting up in the bunk and he's sort of watching this new environment into which he's thrown, looking for an opportunity to participate, to, to blend in, right? To be, become a member of, of this barracks room and pre presumably some effort to fight back, right? And he figures, you know, I'm a journalist, somehow my skills are gonna be of some value. Maybe they'll give me a radio room up, a job or I'll be able to do some translations or something. Anyway, first night he's sitting on the bunk and all of a sudden, as the lights go out, he sees a shiny body emerge from the floor. There's a tunnel in his very room, or an entrance to it. Out comes the shiny body, naked. Guys have been moving back and forth with, you know, and there's sand flying around and all in the dark. And then they, the, the sort of the candles and the kerosene lamps come up and he's watching all this. He's thinking, I'm there, I, let's go. I'm, I'm, I'm ready, to, I wanna get involved. Anyway, they find out that he's a journalist and they line him up with the guy who's, at that point, the chief of intelligence. And he says, you mean I'm going to be able to help you out with the, yeah, yeah. And they send him, <laughs> they send him to a, a neighboring barracks room on a sunny afternoon, a couple of days later, and he goes into the room and he sees a British officer at a table cutting little triangles of tissue paper and inscribing something on the tissue paper. And in front of him are two or three jars with gauze over top and gloves on the, on the tabletop. He invites him in to sit down, and Brown is looking at, what the heck's all this about? And he sits down, and, and in this very um, a welcoming and, and sort of typical British uh, kind of, um, uh, I say typical, he's very welcoming and, and engaging, and he says, sit down, and we'll tell you the, how the, the things, how the, we'll show you the ropes. He sits down, and he's looking at these jars, and all of a sudden he becomes conscious of the fact that the jars are humming. Why? There are bumblebees in the jars. <laughs> and there's thread on the table. And the officer tells Brown to put gloves on and very gently reach into one of the jars, pull out a bumblebee very gently in, with your gloves on so that we can slip a thread over its thorax with a little piece of tissue on it. And on the tissue is written on two sides, Germany is defeated. Hitler will die so that they release these bees to go off into the German countryside to terrorize the civilian pop, or at least to demoralize the civilian population with these little indicators that somehow these bees have been captured to be used as propaganda, to distribute propaganda. And that's what he did in his first days in the intelligence section. As he, he went on, as I say, to get involved in the gathering of information. Here is something for which he gathered information. This is a pass. Um, it's a, it's, it gives the holder of, the, of this document the ability to move across a border through a checkpoint. And I think it's it, because it's, um, anybody can translate that for me? I've forgotten, it's Urlaub Schein. It's, it's a pass that allows you to move from one place to another. It was probably designed for a worker. Many of the guys escaping on the night of the escape, on the 24th of March, 1944, when they went through the tunnel, were hard arsers. Guys who were left up to their own devices to get as far as they could with whatever documentation and whatever capability they had physically and otherwise. Many of the first through the tunnels, about the first 30 to 40 of them, were dressed in manufactured clothing that made them look like business people. Um, they had briefcases that were made out of cardboard, all kinds of magical things they created. But the hard arsers might have passes like this, and, and Kingsley Brown's job was to go into the library and find out who these guys were and forge their signatures, match them, so that all the documents could be prepared to look absolutely authentic. Look at the date, March the 23rd, 1944, stamped the way it was supposed to be stamped because the escape was the next day. And it wasn't stamped until March the 23rd because they didn't decide until March the 23rd that they were gonna do the escape on the 24th. This probably took a year to make to get the right paper, to get the accuracy of the signatures, all the right data in all the right places. And if somebody screwed up, 
a year's work had to be tossed away. And that's what Kingsley was gathering, was the details. And they used to, and they made these insignia with the German eagle by carving the opposite, the negative, into leather heels. And then they practiced stamping with the appropriate amount of ink to deliver the insignia that matched the German stamp of approval. And the people who were working on these things, here's Frank um, Sorensen, the guy I mentioned a minute ago, um, oops, um, uh, who um, had been, who had the letters with the source reference. On the, right, on the left is an, a man named Robert Buckham, who was an artist. He was one of the men working on all of the forgeries. And he says in his memoirs, I was taught by the group of seven to become a forger. <laughs> he was a commercial artist, and he learned at classes, uh, I think it was Arthur Lismer he learned from, his, some of his artistic skills, and they were used to replicate documents in the Great Escape. I mean, is there anything more Canadian than the group of seven? <laughs> Holy smokes, this is a, what a story. Anyway, then there's a story of John Colwell, Colville, Colwell. <laughs> this guy is a tinkerer. He's a navigator, he gets shot down early on in the war, and, and actually before he was shot down over Europe, he was, he was shot down um, on, on friendly soil, but they had to try to repair the aircraft, and they were told the repair parts would be, um, it wasn't shot down, they, they had an engine failure thing. And they said that the, the, I think the radiator would be many weeks coming before they could install, and he just built one out of gear that he had. He could make anything out of anything. When he arrived in Stalag Love 3, around the, where's the date? Here. Anyway, the date's there, it would have been 41 or 42, 43, there it is. Um, 4th of April, 1943, uh, which is right after they arrived in the North Compound. And <laughs> the tunnels are well underway by the time he arrives. And he arrives, and he gets cleared at the gate, and he, he joins a couple of the guys with whom he was shot down, they survive, and he immediately sets up shop in one of the huts as the chief cook and bottle washer and tinker. And he builds, uh, here, he builds pots and pans, and all men, I mean, this is just a, a limited number of items, but it gives you a sense of their living quarters. He built everything from scratch. They found scrap metal, scrap wood, nails, bits and pieces of wire, and he built everything from legal to illegal. Tools that were used for the escape and those they needed to live. And he built everything. And sometimes they would confiscate everything and move them to another barracks, and he'd start all over again. He never stopped. And he wrote a diary, which is exquisite. He was wonderfully articulate in his, in his descriptions of events. Um, and I quote him many times in the book, in, in, uh, in uh, chronological order. And he writes about the experience of being <laughs> um, his, his first unofficial parachute jump um, and landing in the camp and doing all the cooking and all the preparations and so on. Anyway, he's, some of his, his stories are, are there and his description's quite vivid. Uh, where was I going with that? Um, oh yes, he had to hide the diary because they were legal. And he built a cuckoo clock. And he put the diary pages in the pendulum of the cuckoo clock, so that the Germans couldn't find it. Cuckoo clock's fine. Looks okay, nothing abnormal, but inside was his diary in the, in the pendulum. Here is uh, Bartlett, who is the uh, dive bomber, the guy who hid the canary, the radio. Here is the radio being used. This is a photograph of, uh, it's out of proportion, out of whack, because it was taken in a hurry. Um, three guys working with the radio. He's listening and, and taking the, the Morse code references, He's taking it shorthand, and Bartlett is off to one side as they watch. And they were trained that if a German ferret was approaching, they could disassemble the radio and, if need be, eat the messages and destroy the coils in the radio in 30 seconds. Here's the one American in the Canadian forces at the camp. His name is George Hatch. Harsh, George Harsh, sorry. <laughs> what a story, I'll try to abbreviate it. Are, are we okay? Am I, anybody getting to the end of their, their comfort level here? <laughs> um, a couple more stories and then we'll wrap it up. Um, George Harsh was born in 
Wisconsin. Went to a college, very high-end Ivy League college in Atlanta. Starts with an O and I've forgotten it. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Sorry? It's in the book, I forgot. Anyway, he's, he's, he uh, meets a bunch of other fairly well-off young men, and they decide, in their wisdom, to try to pull off the perfect crime in the Atlanta area. And they start robbing grocery stores and convection stores, all, you know, like little gas stations, that sort of thing. And they pull off two or three of them. George is turned, he's got a gun, he goes in, and it's a, it's a grocery store, and the clerk has a gun, catches him, just is about to fire, and George fires back at him. He runs, he's caught, he's uh, tried, sentenced to death, gets a pardon, sent to a chain gang. From 1928 until 1940, 41, he's on a chain gang, fights for his life, uh, barely survives, but in the course of his experience in the chain gang, begins to um, win favor with his uh, captors and or the, the prison wardens. He's, he learns medicine, he saves a man's life, does an, an emergency appendicitis, or appendix uh, removal. <coughs> Appendectomy, thank you. And um, um, is pardoned after 12 years on chain gang and in the prison system. Gets out, leaves the country, goes to Montreal, joins the Air Force, gets shot down, ends up in the camp. Who do you want handling prison security on the tunnel but a guy who's been 12 years on a chain gang? George becomes the head of security for the tunnels. Every stooge in the operation answers to him because he organizes the entire thing. And, and in fact, he's hoodwinked into doing it by, by Wally Floody. Wally Floody finds out he's in the camp, knows who he is, and dragoons him into becoming the head of security, and he runs the security of the whole operation. Now, along the way, the Germans permitted the Allies, or the Commonwealth Airmen, to build a theater for their entertainment. Here's what it looked like inside. Very ornate, quite, can't see the detail, it's better in the book. These are the box frames from the Red Cross packages that arrived weekly. They built them into chairs. There's a full stage area. They had an orchestra. Art Crichton was a, a conductor who had, he was from Edmonton. He was shot down and he became the orchestra leader, got all of the instruments, they got them shipped in through uh, the Red Cross, the Swiss sources and so on, and they had a full orchestra. All the uniforms in the camp went to the orchestra members so that everyone was presentable for whatever was going on. They had band concerts, they had shows, they had comedies. There was a different show every week. The German officers were welcomed because they wanted to see the shows and they sat in the front row. Seat number 13 had an, an interesting background. Seat number 13 had a two-way seat. It lifted up. You know how theater floors are constructed. It's raked. There's a whole lot of space under there. Guess what went in there? About 10 tons of sand from Herod. And here's a picture, here's another image of, this is another Lee Kenyon image of the backstage area getting um, all of the makeup. Men and uh, actors and actresses, as it were, the men, some of the men who were dressed up. There's our friend Tony Pengelly on the right. <laughs> he said, I spent the war in drag. <laughs> and there's Tony again, right there. Look at the hair, again. And there it's all just pushed back. They managed to hide most of the sand from January to March, when sand would be, remember in the movie, they scuff it into the dirt, in the gardens and all that stuff? So, well, that, that's well and good in the spring and the summertime, and maybe even the fall. You can't do it in the winter, because the snow's there. But they suddenly realized that there was all this space under the theater uh, raking, raked floor, and they packed it in there. The guy who was in charge of packing it all in was John Caldwell, our tinkerer. He took care of that hole. He was the, the, the chain gang operator getting all of the, or the bucket uh, brigade getting all the sand in there. Oh, here's a picture of me at the theater. This is the outer frame here. This, this is actually a, a brick foundation. That's the sand. All of that is the sand 
I came back with several vials of it, just to make it happen. <laughs> Another image from Lee Kenyon of the escape. Remember in the movie, they're about 10 meters short of the woods and the signal system in the blind in the woods where the, there was some, some uh, bush so that the guy could hide and tug on the line every time the sentry went the other way. And then the lights go out when there's an air raid going on and many more of them got out. And then at the end of it all, when the German guard spots them at about five o'clock in the morning and fires a shot because he's so startled, 80 men had gotten out of the tunnel. There were four in the, three or four in the immediate district of the mouth of the tunnel, the top of the shaft and the other end of Harry. They were captured right there. So were 73 others. Three men made it all the way back home. This man was given the job by Hitler of murdering 50 of them. And the story of how he made the choices and the story, as grim as it is, of how they were done is not depicted in the movie. At the end of the movie, you remember they stopped them for a break to get some fresh air, stretch their legs, and they mowed them all down the machine gun. Uh -uh. These guys were killed by hired thugs of the Gestapo and murdered in twos and threes. And the documentation comes out of an RAF um, investigation team whose documents of the interviews done with those complicit in the murders has never been published before. I got the document. It's this thick. And all of it, as grim as it is, has never been published before. It's in the book. Um, this is a fellow by the name of Ogilvy, Keith Ogilvy, Skeets Ogilvy. He was so good with his aim, he shot down almost. He was almost an ace in the, in the in spite of the fact that he was shot down early in the war. Um, uh, he saved uh, Buckingham Palace. There was a, uh, a German bomber about to bomb. Buckingham Palace, and he shot it out of the sky, and he got the DFC for it. Anyway, uh, he ended up in the camp, and it was he who got the farthest from the camp on the night and the morning of the escape. He managed to get about 65 kilometers as a hard arser on foot away from the camp. And what he does in his, in his um, testimony later to the British authorities who are trying to track down the murderers of the 50 airmen is he, he manages to get this document. Here is a translation of the way the Germans um, came up with the excuse for why the 50 were shot. There's the German, here's the English. In the course of an enterprise to recapture British Air Force officers who had escaped in a large number, some of them offered resistance on being arrested. After recaptured, others tried again to escape on the transport back to their camp. In these cases, the firearms had to be made use of. 50 prisoners of war were hereby shot. And he knows, Ogilvy knows, that they were hauled away, many of them in uniform, not in disguise, in their Air Force uniforms. He saw them taken away and murdered. And Ogilvy reports this back, and that's the beginning of how they track these guys down, the men who were involved in complicit in the murders. And this is a, another Lee Kenyon sketch of the monument that was built just on the edge of Stalag Luft Three. It's still there today and it has the inscriptions of the 50 men killed. And their, originally their ashes were buried there. Of course, the Germans uh, cremated them to hide the evidence. And their ashes were originally buried there, then moved to a place called Poznan, I think it is, in Poland. Have I got it right? Did that say sorry on the bottom there? Sorry? It <laughs> yes, it does say sorry. You know why? Because this is a, 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 a version of the sketch that Lee Kenyon gave to Frank Sorensen, who was known as Sorry Sorensen. Yes. And it was given to him in September of 44. Here's the forced march, an illegal photograph taken of them being marched away from the camp by the thousands in the coldest days of the winter. Sketches from from um, Mr. Uh, Buckham, the artist, the, this group of seven trained artists, he made sketches of, the, of some of this trekking that went on over the months um, of the forced march. The, the Germans hauled all these guys off across Europe to, to use them as barter to get themselves um, to the Americans and get more favorable treatment as a result of trading the prisoners back to the, to the Americans. This is, this, is, this is January, February, March, April, May, right up to VE Day in May. 
1945, and there's the sign in the last place these guys were holed up in Germany. They tacked it up because the Americans and the Canadians and, and the British were coming west, east, and they wanted to make sure that they were safe from their own guys. In fact, their documentation, and I, and I came across it and use it in the book, of many of the, not many, some of the Kriegies, they were called. These were the, that was the nickname for the prisoners of war. They called themselves Kriegies. There's a long German name. Thank prisoners you. Of war. Prisoners of war. They called themselves Kriegies. There were, there are instances where many of the Kriegies, some of the Kriegies were killed by strafing aircraft, the, the Allied aircraft, not knowing that these guys were prisoners. And so we come back to the myth. He did all of this writing, except that cut. That's not him. And so the great escape, an American myth, is now a Canadian truth. I hope I kind of stumbled around there a few times and I apologize. I'm just starting to get this into my brain in some reasonable order. I hope it was reasonably coherent. You were very attentive and very forgiving in tolerating my stumbling around. Thank you so much. Does anyone have any questions for Ted? Oh, yeah, please. I haven't really talked about any of the editing process, which is really, I'm sorry, I really, I really betrayed you, because um, that's a very important part of, of this process. Um, and um, uh, I've I worked with a lot of really good editors over the years. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning, though, that, this, that the company was bought during the course of this, and just before the company was bought, the man who was my principal editor, Patrick Crean, left Thomas Allen, as did Janice Zawardney, the woman who was assigned to edit the book. She left. So it was shipped out to a woman named Linda Prusen, and she did most of the editing, and she was a dream to work with. She, was, she understood the story, but it was still a lot of it was new to her, and so she gobbled it up, as I'd hoped anyone would. But she was great in helping keep me on track. Um, uh, and then I had my colleagues with whom I edited in the journalism department at uh, Centennial. I had two of my colleagues read every word of this thing, and they kept me quite literally on the, on the straight and narrow and keeping everything in a reasonably uh, appropriate order. In a, in a book like this, you'd think it's simple a matter of, okay, you got a bunch of guys in one spot, and you tell their story, uh, then there's this escape, and then they run, and then there's murders, okay? And you sort of, it's all kind of, well, one of my colleagues caught me on something, and it was a, and it was a perfect catch, and it wasn't an error, it was an error of judgment. Uh, do I explain this? Because this is really, this is really important, and if you're, and if you're editing long form, you are worth your weight in gold when you catch people like, such as myself, missing this. And I won't ever admit having a fault, but I have to know, um, in front of my former students. Um, what happened was, when I got to Keith Ogilvie's story of the escape, or how far he got, at the end of the chapter, whatever is chapter 8 or 9, I bring the chapter to an end at the shot that the German guard fires, stopping the whole thing. Or something. I can't. I think that was the original draft. Mm -hmm. And then, in the next chapter or in the next section of the book, I love Keith's escape story so much that I took you along with me into his story of running and freezing and trying to, to find his way to Czechoslovakia in the snow. And because there was a meter of snow on the ground, they, they, this, the movie doesn't even show that. Anyway. Uh, he stumbles for a couple of days, gets about 65 kilometers, and at the point that he's captured, I go back in the order of the book and tell what happened back in the camp after the, the shot was fired. My, my colleague, Malcolm Kelly, who runs the sports journalism department at Centennial, said, Ted, you can't do that. I said, what do you mean I can't do that? His story follows logically after the escape. He's one of the last guys out of the tunnel. 
Why not falling? He said, you can't do that because you haven't cleaned up the business inside the camp yet. He had, we, I haven't told you what happened inside the huts where all the rest of the guys were waiting for the escape and all the other things that went on in the camp after the, the shot was fired. And he was absolutely right. Because I got seduced by the Keith Ogilvie story, I went pfft, yeah. head over heels following him, and I forgot about what was going on in the camp. I, came, I asked you, as the reader, to say, and oh yes, by the way, 48 hours earlier, this is how the, the escape ended inside the camp. And Malcolm quite rightly said, you can't do that. So I rewrote that whole section, put it in order, and at the firing of the shot, we go back inside the huts, they were burning the documents and eating the food madly that they had saved the remaining hundred or so of the Kriegis waiting to get out. And then they were horribly treated because it started to snow and they were stripped, most of them naked, standing in the appell area while the, the roll call, name by name, card by card, was processed because they had to know who was there and who wasn't. And these guys suffered in the cold for the next day. And that's clear in the redraft before I take you with me to the places where the escapers ran to and what happened to them afterwards. Logical, Malcolm, I love him for that. <laughs> uh, because he, he thinks like an editor. <laughs> Questions? Yeah? Why did you decide to write this story? Because it's Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I didn't realize it at first. Um, I've got this reputation for being a military historian. I'm not a military historian. Yeah, I know a lot about military stuff, and I know about weapons and tanks and airplanes and all that stuff. But the people who know about that stuff better than I are the ones who go to all those museums and little shows where they kind of argue over, is that a 4.7 thing or a 4.8, you know, and I don't care. All my books, all 17 of them, I hope, are people stories. and eight or ten of them are people in wartime situations. That's the initial criterion of doing something like this. But when I realized how much stuff was Canadian and untold, I was drawn to it. I had to do this. So I've been working on this for years. And Patrick, when I told Patrick, I said, do you know that that movie you saw back in 1960, because he and I are the same age. I said, do you know that movie you saw back, we saw in 1963 is a lot of horseshit? <laughs> He said, no, come on, that's Hollywood, but I said, and I started to lay out like cards on the table, some of the stuff I found, and he said, you've got to write this. And one last story I'll tell you connected to, sometimes there's brilliance, sometimes there's intelligence, sometimes there's luck, and sometimes there's <laughs> incredible luck. I have a knack for falling into some of these things. Um, Tony Pengelly, nobody's ever heard of Tony Pengelly, unless you had a family member or something. Did you know the name? Okay. Um, Tony Pengelly, the guy who was the forger, his family lived across <coughs> my back fence where I grew up in Agent Court. I knew the family was there. I, I played with his son, because we were about the same age, and my best friend still lives in London, uh, Ontario. He and I played with Chris. Uh, the, the Pengelly son, but then they moved away part way through our high school careers. I never saw them again. I never saw the family again. I didn't know about the Air Force connection at all. I'm going through McLean's magazine in, from 1945, and there are some memoirs in the McLean's magazine of Pengelly's story, buried away in the back pages of McLean's. Anyway, so I visited my friend Dave in London one night, and I'm telling him, you know, I think I'm going to do this great escape book. And he says, have you got Pengelly's story? And I said, I'm looking for it. And I said, have you any idea where Chris is? Now, I'm sure that Andrea and Laura will tell you chapter and verse about how I hate social media. <laughs> Probably Laura more than I was shocked to hear you were on Twitter. <laughs> it has a place. But I've never used, until recently, Facebook and Twitter. The night I was visiting Dave, his wife, Mary, takes out her computer as we're talking and goes on Facebook in search of Chris Bengali. And I'm thinking, what the hell is she doing? And bingo, a bunch of faces come up. And sure enough, one looks like he's about our age. And Dave says, yeah, that's got to be him because there's a reference to Lawrence Park. That's where the family went after they left Agent Corps. 
So Mary clicks off a note. Um, our friend uh, Ted Barris working on a book about uh, the Great Escape. Are you the Chris Pengelly who's the son of Tony Pengelly? Uh, could you contact us? I drove home from London to Oxbridge. I got home, opened up my computer, bingo. She, he called her or communicated with her. Turns out he runs a little bistro down in Prince Edward County called the Milford Bistro. Anybody been there? It's this wonderful <laughs> restaurant in a general store. It's Chris's restaurant. I called him, I said, Chris, you may not remember me. We lived across the Oh yeah, I remember that, yeah. I said, I'm interested in your father's story in The Great Escape. Oh really, he says. I said, yeah. I said, have you got anything that would help me? He said, come on down. <laughs> <laughs> so my wife and I and Dave and Mary went down. We spent a weekend in doing the B&B &B thing down in Prince Edward County. And on the Sunday morning, he invited us after we'd had dinner at the, at the bistro on the Saturday. Gorgeous, beautiful. I mean, he's a terrific chef. Anyway, we had uh, the dinner in the bistro, and then he invited us back for coffee and scones on the Sunday morning, and he took us to the apartment above the bistro in the, in the general store, and he brought out a suitcase. And in the suitcase, letters, diaries, mm -hmm. photographs. That photograph was in there. Aww. And it was like I'd struck gold. Oh. And it just happens again and again and again. I'm just lucky. <laughs> lucky. Yeah, Facebook. <laughs> the only thing, the only thing that's, that's, that's not real in here is the barbed wire. That was the effect oh. of putting it in but the, the artist involved in the, in the jacket. And I, you know, I've struggled with it for a while, but it works. It gives it a, just a little bit of a different yeah. one. Did his yeah. father survive the one? Sorry? Did his father survive yes. the one? Yes. <laughs> um, Tony came home. And like so many of these guys, and I've written about this in the previous book called Breaking the Silence. And the silence, of course, is the silence of veterans. Yeah. I've interviewed probably 5,000 veterans in my time. I never got to interview Tony, because uh, I didn't get to him in time. This is my interest in it, sort of, sort of intense interest didn't come until quite late. But um, he came back and was told by all the shrinks around, don't talk about it. It's PTSD. They, they knew post-traumatic stress by this time. Don't talk about it, move on. And all these guys did, to their own detriment, yeah, yeah. in many cases. Tony wanted to talk about it. He wanted to tell his story. He wrote some of the stuff, that, it was in the suitcase. That's how I got the story. But he never told anybody, as was the case with Frank Sorensen. Frank Sorensen, the guy who wrote for the thesauruses, he was a mess. <laughs> Vicky, I went down and I interviewed Vicky and her two brothers. He turned into a monster after the war, drinking. Violence, and I mean, he, Vicky and, and his and her brothers will admit it. In fact, they do. I, in in the last chapter of the book, I take about a dozen of the men and follow them to their present day, so that you get a sense of how this had an impact on them and their families. What makes this story go on, one maybe for good or not, is that the kids are as interested in it as I am, and they start searching and have been searching for as long as they've been conscious of the story. And they've helped me get s details that I didn't have. That's another layer of research that, sh that, that writers can depend on are the families, the children of. And I refer to them as the children of the Creekies because they're, some of the stories were just extraordinary and led me to be able to sort of tie off many of the stories of these guys. Um, when Kingsley Brown comes home, he was the, with the bumblebees and the intelligence and stuff. Mm -hmm. When he came, went home, he went back to Nova Scotia and he began to run the general store of his father-in-law because there was in a town of 25 people. He wanted to get as far from civilization as possible, do as little as possible that required anybody to tell him what to do. And he stayed there for a number of years. And then he came back to journalism and he wrote a lot of his experiences. Yes, I have a question. Sure. Do you know if uh, Floyd had a Toronto connection? Yes. Um, the reason I ask that is because um, in a park in South Rosedale, Craigley Gardens, there's actually a memorial plaque in his name. I didn't know that. And it says the Great Escape. Yep. In his name. Well, um, I got um, all of Floody's material from his son and, and uh, daughter in law. They gave me all of his transcripts and a couple of videotapes that were done in the 70s and 80s of interviews with him when he remembered all of this stuff. That, you know, nobody's bothered to look at the tapes. They've been sitting there for years. And so that helped reveal much of what I needed from his perspective. Do you know of the Great Escape bookstore? 
Toronto. Yes, or, or no, it's a restaurant, isn't it? No, it's a bookstore, and it's full of pictures of the... Oh, I didn't know that. No, I don't. Where is it? It's a great it? place for a lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Where is it? It's uh, on, on Kingston Road, near Victoria Park. Hmm. It's uh, funny. I go by there all the time, and I've never seen right, it. Yeah, it's on the, the south it's, and side. And it's a, it's, it's like, called the Great Escape. And, it, and it's a, like a store with it's just. Store. It's a. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it just shows you how you, you work in your own world. And you you walk by so and you miss it. I was thinking, I've got to go to the bookstore and find yeah. like They know that you're writing this. I hope they do, but, they, <laughs> but because so that. Be in their window. Well, that's great. I'll have, I'll have to get a hold. Wow. Thank you. Yes. Uh, what do the the people you talk to uh, for the story think about the movie? Ha, good question. Some of them hated it, some of them loved it. But when Wally Floody, some of the data I got from his his kids, or his son and, and daughter-in-law, and there was I think another relative in there, he talks about being the consultant on the movie because they actually took him to Europe. The, the film was shot in Bavaria, and I talk about this in the last, that's the last, in the last chapter, I follow Wally to the shooting of the movie, because he became the tech advisor on it. And he went over there, spent several weeks giving them advice on uh, the dimensions of the tunnel. At one point he says, there's too much room in the tunnel, you gotta make it smaller, because it doesn't look the way it did. And so they did. And he talks about the, the penguins, the guys who had the bags in their pants, and how they worked the strings on the little pouches to drop the dirt and so on. He showed them how to do that. Anyway, at, on his last evening with the, the film shoot, uh, John Sturgis and the, and the um, uh, what was the film company? Universal, I think. Um, they had a little dinner, and they asked Wally about his experience and whether they were getting it accurately. And he said, well, I don't know about totally accurately, but now I'm having nightmares again. Aww. So it was all coming back. Um, just, you know, like, they, I, I've now forgotten the question. Did you ask me? I'm sorry. Sorry. Well, I guess, I, I guess you think, I mean, just knowing my grandfather's experience in the war, he didn't like anything about the war. Oh, the movie. Right. right. So yeah. it's just like, do they, do the people resent the story being told so inaccurately. Well, I have to tell you that sometimes I had the problem to make them realize that it was their it was their story, not an American story. I mean, it's like Argo. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. You know, yeah. fortunately, the documentary with Ken yeah. Taylor is now out. Yeah. Now he's he's yeah. very very um, uh, accommodating and and forgiving of and he's he's been very. Um, uh, complimentary of, of uh, Ben Affleck and, uh, and the original film. He hasn't criticized it at all. Mind you, he wasn't invited to the yeah. damn opening yes. last year. <laughs> but now the documentary's out, and he's had a chance to, to say his piece, and he's been very he's been very uh, gracious about it. Yeah. Um, but uh, on the whole, I mean, they actually had the, the opening in Toronto was a fundraiser for the Prisoners of War Association, mm -hmm. and Wally organized that to make sure that as many of the guys, surviving guys, within the sort of lower southern Ontario area could get to see it. And they had hundreds of them there, um, or people who'd been at the camp, anyway. And they raised a lot of money for the POW Association. So there was a lot of, a, a lot of attention paid it. But I, I remember the night I took my daughter to see Saving Private Ryan up in Newmarket. And on the way in, we saw vets coming out. And they were visibly shaken. I mean, they were a mess, some of them, because they'd probably done the D-Day or shortly thereafter landings, and it was all back again. Um, and in my book, uh, Breaking the Silence, um, I, I went back to Normandy with Don Kerr, who had landed on Gold Beach, and he described what he saw and what it was like. And he said for years he couldn't go back there because he just couldn't face the possibility that he'd fall apart. He did, when we, when we went back together, he broke down and cried a lot, but he felt that he, it was the right time to do it. Um, it's an extraordinary experience, and that, so, I, it, some of them loved it, some of them hated it. Um, uh, Chris Pengelly, when I interviewed Chris, who gave me Tony's stuff, I said, what did your dad think of the movie? He said, my dad couldn't watch it without going back and it, it bothered him. What he liked to watch was Hogan's Heroes. <laughs> because he could laugh at it. And if he could laugh at it, somehow it made it more digestible. 
than the reality. And that's in the book, too, that another sort of denouement moment. I'm really proud of this book. It's been, it's been a long time coming, and, I, and thanks to people like Malcolm and, and, and Patrick at, at, the, uh, at Thomas Allen, uh, we made sure that this thing was nice and, tight, nice and tight and clean, and it's not a long book. It's only about 300 some pages, and um, uh, it's now. There've been a lot of books written about the Great Escape, as evidenced by the story. Yes. Yeah. I'm going to have to find it. But even Paul Brickhill, if you read Paul Brickhill's book on it, it kind of meanders around. It doesn't quite. It's, it leaves you lost all the time about who the people are, because he uses this, the uh, nicknames all the time, and you don't know who's who. There must have been five Johnnies, and none of them were named John. They just called them John. I mean, and I, like I couldn't keep track. Um, and some books have been done in Canada on a, a, a book by Jonathan Vance called A Gallant Company, in which he traces uh, all of the Canadians and all the others. And with all due respect to Jonathan, it's dense with biography, and you really come away with a sense of who these guys were. But you lose the sense of the of the excitement of this story. It's horribly pathetic at the end with the loss of these brilliant men. But the story is, I mean, it, uh, I, I just couldn't get it out of my system fast enough. I wrote the, the manuscript in about three months last summer. But it was like day, day in, day in, and I did, because I, I only had a certain window in there to write before I had to teach again. Anyway, I'm sort of nabbering on it. Any other questions? Yeah. It's nuts. <laughs> uh, but if I can, if, 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 yeah, I, I, I've got uh, about 30 speeches between now and, and December, uh, and that's all with my daytime teaching and other stuff that I'm writing. I've got a piece on the uh, on the, the escape in the current or upcoming Zoomer magazine, another one in Air Force magazine, um, and if all goes well, I hope Michael Enright will interview me in, me in October for the Sunday edition. So that'll be fun. Yes, um, the, the launch, the sort of unofficial launch is the day after tomorrow. Um, any of you who know Uxbridge, you know that we have the Celebration of the Arts every year, and every Thursday in that sequence of a couple of weeks, we have Books and Authors Night, and I've been MC of it for 25 years. But this time I get a chance to take one of the four spots that we give to four authors on the evening. I'm gonna get time to do a little bit of reading and a little bit of talking. How the hell am I gonna keep it into a couple of minutes? <laughs> Impossible. Well, hopefully you'll stick around. Uh, yeah, I'd love to. So if anyone else has any questions, please uh, do come and talk to Ted. I just want to thank you so much for joining us this evening and for sharing this great Canadian story. And um, I know that when I invited you, you told me that this was going to be a very busy time for you. So we're very grateful that you took time out of your schedule to come and chat with us. Much appreciated. Thank you. Do I drink it? Uh, no. Oh. <laughs> but thank you so much. Um, and on behalf of our speakers for 2013, we do um, donate to um, a charity, which is Literature for Life, um, and we will be selecting a new charity in 2014. Um, copies of Ted's book is available for purchase on the table there, and one lucky winner will be going home with a copy this evening. Um, underneath someone's chair, there is a maple leaf. <laughs> and they tore the seats apart. Who's <laughs> <laughs> got it? There it is. You can even press it in the book. Tweeting all this? I have not. Oh. <laughs> this is Laura? for Laura because I sadly neglected to make this announcement on her behalf. Um, as some of you may know, some of you may not know, EAC Toronto is transitioning the newsletter 
addition to a blog format. So keep your eyes peeled in the coming weeks for an announcement about the official launch of our new blog. So we're still going to be having the regular book reviews, uh, reports on the goings on of the Toronto branch and so on, but it will be published on the blog instead. We are currently looking for volunteer writers, copy editors, photographers, and illustrators to contribute. So if you're interested in contrib contributing even just one article, even if you're not sure of a topic, talk to Laura. She's right there. <laughs> um, uh, her email address is Toronto underscore VR underscore publications underscore. Yeah, and if you've, if you've volunteered for edition before, she'd love to have you on board. Finally, one last announcement to do with the blog. We need a name for the blog. So we're going to have a contest, I imagine. Is it a contest? Yeah, it's a contest. It's a, it's a form of contest. Um, so they'd like to get your suggestions in by September 27th, which is Friday. That's a fun <laughs> So, this Friday, oh my gosh. Um, yeah, so it, they want it simple, to the point, or witty and original, and uh, That's all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 all of the above, apparently. Uh, and the tagline will say the official blog of EAC's Toronto branch. So get your suggestions in, and you'll receive a check on your My Rewards card, and, yes. uh, and a feature uh, profile of yourself oh. on the blog Ooh. if we choose your suggestion. <laughs> Here you go. So. If you're interested, email or talk to me. Or just talk to me. Yeah. Or go to the website. Do you have options? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>